Before we start the show this week, we wanted to take a quick second to tell you about a new initiative we're introducing in the podcast, which is our Talking Cars donation program. For those that don't know, CR is a nonprofit, and we're able to do all of the work we do, including anonymously buying our test cars and producing this show through memberships to our website and magazine, as well as through donations. What the Talking Cars donation program will do is allow loyal Talking Cars fans to show support for the podcast, assist in supporting the costs of producing the podcast, as well as support all the work CR does to keep consumers safe. You'll be able to contribute either as a one-time donation or on a monthly basis. Even $5 a month really helps. Go to CR.org slash give Talking Cars to find out more. In any event, We'll keep delivering talking cars each and every week. Again, go to cr.org slash give talking cars to find out more. Thanks for watching and enjoy the show. On this episode, we share the results from our test of the Volkswagen Atlas Cross Sport. Then we talk about two new flagships, the Jeep Grand Wagoneer and the Mercedes S-Class. And we answer your questions about EVs, car buying, and tires. Next on Talking Cars. Hey, welcome back. I'm Keith Barry. I'm Ryan Pizlikowski. I'm Gabe Shenhor. This week, we're going to start off with some luxury vehicles, and not just any luxury vehicles, but ones that if you were a time traveler from 1985, uh, you would recognize the nameplates. Uh, one of them is a return. Another one is... Uh, it's a venerable nameplate that's been around for a while. So let's start off. A new Grand Wagoneer. Uh, Gabe, what's what's up with this? We've been waiting for it for a long time. It's finally here. It has seven passengers. What's up? So everybody has been waiting for a Wagoneer, a resurrection of a classic. Uh, the, the Jeep Wagoneer was a staple of uh well-heeled suburbanites uh, in the 70s and the 80s. Uh, I mean, if you remember, some of them had a wood, wooded panels. And it was basically the Range Rover of America. Uh, so uh, a very, uh, you know, a luxurious uh, SUV, uh, a status symbol. And uh, Jeep's been talking about resurrecting the, uh, the Wagoneer nameplate for years. And finally... Uh, they showed a concept, only a concept. So this normally would be shown at an auto show, um, but it indicates to a direction that they're taking. Yeah, it looks production it's ready. It's going right? to be. It, yeah. it looks uh, mostly production ready. Of course, some of the uh, the extreme things won't be there, like the uh, oversized wheels and, and some other features. But anyway, um, uh, not being in that uh, slice of the market, a luxury SUV is a major miss for uh, Chrysler. So FCA, FCA rather, uh, you have the, the Tahoe, the Suburban, you have uh, you have the Expedition in both lengths. So uh, this uh, Wagoneer is going to be based on the Ram pickup truck, which is really uh, very solid bones. Um, unlike the Ram, it's going to have independent rear suspension, just like its competitors from GM and Ford. And uh, it's, uh, it's going to be uh, really high-tech. As a concept, they only introduced uh, a plug-in hybrid. But when it comes to real production next summer, it's going to have, uh, likely, it's going to have the 3.6 liter V6 and uh, the 5.7 liter V8, which are all uh, pretty decent engines. And it's expensive, right? <laughs> Well, it's, uh, I mean, expensive, but on par with where the class is. So, uh, you, you get a, uh, you look at a Tahoe or an Expedition or in Suburban. I mean, these vehicles are expensive. They uh, start at about 60,000 and they can uh, top out at, uh, 90,000 as well. Yeah, and this is what the Grand Wagoneers six figures and the regular Wagoneer is about 60,000, right? Right. So yeah, there are going to be two lengths. Uh, the regular length is going to be the Wagoneer and the uh, the extra long wheelbase is going to be the Grand Wagoneer. And that's, uh, of course, going to be more expensive. And so like Escalade, Escalade ESV, that kind of, that kind yeah, of that, idea. Yeah, along these lines. Yeah. yeah. Ryan, what do you, what do you th I mean, I, I, I saw it and I thought, oh, <laughs> <laughs> oh, yeah. So okay, that that's was, it. Yeah. 
Yeah, that was my uh, first reaction. There was some concept photos floating around um, over the past year. Um, these were just photos, you know, drawings or whatnot. And there was some really good looking like uh, renditions of what this thing might look like. And, um, you know, I had that nostalgic grill that's angled back a little and it just looked cool. It looked like, I'm, um, you know, it was a nice throwback to what it was. This doesn't look like that at all, unfortunately. Um, I know it's only styling. I mean, we're going to drive it at some point and test it. Um, it may be the nicest car I've ever driven, but it um, the looks kind of kill it for me. I had a, a good friend of mine growing up. Um, his father had an 88 Grand Wagoneer, and it had the wood paneling. It was like a cream color with the wood paneling, and it was a tank. I mean, I never drove it myself, but I could tell you that it was a tank just from the feeling I had in it when I was riding in it. I remember um, what the it, door handles it, felt like on those things. Yes. I yeah, mean, just the big that chrome. Thunk, yeah. Yeah. And, and the yeah the big the back seat was enormous it was, you know big bench seat um, just such a classic vehicle like Gabe said you know it was kind of a, a legendary a, a American Range Rover you know uh, we haven't really had anything like that um, since but we'll see how this comes out you know so yeah I mean I think one of the one of the nicest things that I liked about the older Grand Wagoneer it wasn't I mean not necessarily the fact that it was retro but the fact that it was timeless to me yeah. it looks it looks like a Lexus GX kind of grafted onto a Durango uh, that <laughs> real uh, really upright and, and intimidating and you know it's it's not that sort of understated luxury speaking of understated luxury we also had the Mercedes S class come out this week I can't imagine a more understated flagship um yeah Ryan what do, what do you think so again I mean the, the looks surprised me a little it kind of um if it wasn't for the rear end, I, from the front, I, I was I'm seeing a C, like a C class. Um, the, you know the smaller headlights. It doesn't have a very um, uh, grand front end like the S class always had. You know, looks wise. But um, again, that I mean, the last time we tested an S class, it was a, a favorite among us um, at the test track. It was just a comfortable. <laughs> you know, it's a comfortable. Um, one of the nicest riding cars out there. Um, you know, it's it's exciting to see what this will have. You know, the price tags just keep growing on all of these cars. So that's. Um, a little uh, <laughs> unnerving, but yeah, I mean, we're we're going to test one, right, Gabe? Yeah, uh, the S Class. Uh, for, uh, I mean, it goes on sale in, in the spring of uh, 2021, and uh, it's always been a standard bearer for uh, the, what a luxury, true luxury, ultra luxury sedan should be. And uh, we've tested uh, several of them over the years, and uh, always they shine in terms of uh, ride comfort in terms of uh, interior quietness i mean this this new generation uh, of course conforms to the styling of uh, the 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 rest of the mercedes sedan lineup as always a new s class brings a host of uh, all kinds of uh, technological innovations and uh, this one's no exception uh, it's a, it brings a new generation of the uh, mbux mercedes benz uh, user experience uh, infotainment system ups the ante on connectivity and uh, it's also going to have a plug-in hybrid uh, as the current one does, but Mercedes is also talking about uh, a, a pure EV conversion as well. So, um, yeah, it uh, it looks promising. Uh, look, S-Class uh, has always been like the dominant uh, seller in that category, but uh, nowadays with, uh, with Tesla and other entries and uh, luxury market, like leaning towards uh, going electric, it's uh, it's going to be interesting to see what happens there. One thing that I find interesting about the S-Class, not just the fact that Mercedes is still using a sedan as their flagship. I think for them, there's a lot of, there's a lot of pride there, even if it isn't, you know, the most practical choice, especially right now, but that they put the, the high end stuff on the Mercedes S-Class. And then we see it in a few years on other Mercedes vehicles. And then we see it across the lineup. If you remember things like adaptive cruise control with this car, the thing I'm most excited about is rear airbags. Um, and, you know, the rear seat, that is an important spot for uh, for people in S classes because they might be they might be driven around. Right, Gabe? <laughs> yeah, completely. Uh, the yeah. one who paid uh, 100, 120 thousand dollars for the S class usually sits in the back. I'll expect <laughs> to sit in. The, I'll sit in the back while you take it on the track. Yeah. So <laughs> find out more about these both of these vehicles. You can head over to CR.org. Also, information about backseat airbags and backseat safety. Uh, speaking of German cars with comfortable back seats, which 
We often are here on Talking Cars. We just finished testing the Volkswagen Atlas Cross Sport. Now, this is one of those kind of coupified SUVs. It's a version of the Volkswagen Atlas, which is a larger SUV, three row SUV. Volkswagen made this one into a two row. They kind of chopped off some of the back uh, and, and gave it a sleeker profile. They gave more legroom. Uh, they gave it a little less headroom and a little less cargo space, about 15 cubic feet less of cargo space than the regular size Atlas. We bought an SE version with a 2.0 liter turbo engine and all wheel drive to test and it came to 40,580 when we purchased it. Uh, the car starts at around 30,500 and goes up to around 50,000 before you get options. Um, so, uh, Gabe? Well, uh, let's start with this. Uh, the Atlas Crossport is uh, on. It, it's very compatible with uh, this whole class that uh, includes uh, mid-size two-row SUVs like the Ford Edge, the Nissan Murano, uh, Chevy Blazer, Honda uh, Passport. So uh, these are uh, all forty thousand dollars about uh, kind of vehicles, and they uh, appeal to people who uh, perhaps uh, have gotten used to driving SUVs. So uh, it gives them a bit of an SUV-ish uh, kind of uh, quality, but in a more stylish uh, envelope. Uh, I mean, it drives uh, pretty nicely. I mean, there's uh, the uh, the two-liter turbo is surprisingly uh, sprite. Spritey and uh, the handling is just pretty decent for such a large vehicle. I mean, the the interior space is enormous. I mean, even though it uh, mm. is uh, compromised and reduced from the regular Atlas, there is still oodles of room in the back seat. The interior, uh, you might uh, argue, is a little little bland. I will say the infotainment system is really good. I mean, it's like just a model of, of clarity. The touchscreen responds quickly. Uh, seats are pretty comfortable, so uh, it's not not a bad vehicle at all. I mean, the only thing that uh, it, it drags down its overall score is the reliability, which we carried over from the regular Atlas. It's, I mean, as far as the vehicle itself, I, I, maybe I just don't get the sort of coupe SUV category. I mean, with the more efficient engine, it only gets one mile a gallon more than the uh, than the regular Atlas we tested that has so much more utility. If you're going to drive something that big, to me, it, it, you, it, you should have a reason for driving something that large. Uh, and that's, I mean, that's that's sort of how I feel about this. But Ryan, have you, uh, what do you think of the I, vehicle? So I, I kind of, I agree with you. I I would just go for the full-size Atlas. Um, give me the extra capacity, um, you know, the cargo space. Um, I thought the regular Atlas handled pretty close to this. It gets a little better fuel economy. And that two liter impressed us. I think I, we weren't expecting that um, type of performance because this thing is pretty big still. They keep slicing these SUVs into these layers. It's smaller and smaller. And it's like, there's a million to choose from. But like you said, if you need, you know, you need a big SUV, you get a big SUV. But this is like, I don't know where this fits, if it fits, you know, because the new Tiguan's fairly good size too. So it's like, it's just another slice of the pie, you know. I think the market has proven that uh, no manufacturer can have too many SUVs uh, and as, as, as finely as you can slice it. And actually, speaking of VW, they're just about to introduce a sub Tiguan SUV. And you see, manufacturers are canceling sedans and uh, doubling down on SUV offerings. Yeah. Yeah, I'll I'll stick with the uh, I'll stick with the RT on I've been driving. <laughs> uh, unless one of these is coming to like pick me up at the you know in when back when people you know used to travel. Uh, if one of these picked me up at the airport, I would be thrilled to have you know just me, my luggage in the back, and I'd be able to just kind of relax in that big back seat. But you know I I don't know. Um, all right. Well, uh, to learn more about the Atlas Cross Sport, you can head over to cr.org. You'll find the full numbers. Uh, all the stats. Um, so on to questions. We love questions. No video questions this week. Please send your video questions to talkingcars at iCloud.com. That way you don't have to look at us. You can look at you. Uh, so <laughs> that's great. Uh, but we do have some great questions this week. The first one comes from uh, Jeremy from San Diego who asks, I've had several gas Mini Cooper S's. I'm interested in replacing my daily driver with the new Mini Cooper SE all electric. Are you going to be getting this vehicle in for testing soon? Also, I'm a little concerned about the battery longevity because this vehicle does not have active thermal battery management. 
But the car seems to fit my needs in most ways, most importantly, the driving characteristics and the styling quirkiness. Uh, this is, for those who don't know, this is Mini's uh, version of an EV. It starts uh, at uh, before destination charge, just under 30000 and that's also before any big tax rebates or incentives that you might get, especially you know locally. So this is a very affordable EV. Uh, it also, though, has a range of 110 miles, which is very low compared to other vehicles out there. Now, uh, I don't know. Jeremy's commute might be very, very short, and it sounds like he has other vehicles. Uh, Gabe, are we going to get this into test? Well, uh, before I answer that, let me uh, set the record straight here. The Mini has a pretty sophisticated uh, thermal management system, and it includes a heat pump as well. Um, we're not going to test it because uh, uh, we have uh, several versions of uh, Mini Cooper tested. Uh, it only has 110 uh, mile of range, which is uh, the shortest uh, on offering right now. I mean, that car would have would have been right uh, maybe six, seven years ago. But now when uh, uh, lots of EVs have uh, robust ranges of over 200 miles, but uh, don't get me wrong, uh, a Mini is uh, drives like nothing else. It's fun to drive. It, uh, uh, it puts a smile on your face. It looks like not nothing else. So, yeah. and when you live in San Diego, then uh, it, it's a pretty, uh, pretty comfortable place for any EV uh, when you don't have to deal with the uh, winter weather. And uh, not to mention that if you start at 30,000 and then you uh, uh, slash 7,500 of uh, the federal tax incentive and California and other states have uh, even uh, additional uh, breaks on uh, EVs, it can be a pretty uh, financial proposition. Yeah. And Gabe, if we do decide to rent one of these, I know we're not buying one, but if we decide to rent one from the manufacturer, I'm putting it out here. I volunteer uh, to do the first drive review on that uh, to get a chance to drive that. So it, it sounds it sounds like a very interesting, interesting vehicle. I've, I've heard it's it's interesting. I've heard a lot of buzz about it, despite the fact that it has that that low range. OK, uh, so good to know. You bought yourself uh, riding a first drive. <laughs> All right. So the next question is also about an EV. This one is from Milton from Iowa, who says, my local dealer tells me the Hyundai Ionic electric will not be sold here in Iowa. I think the Ionic would fit me perfectly considering price and range. Uh, the nearest dealer selling is in the Denver area, 600 miles away. My local dealer tells me their mechanics have been trained on all Hyundai vehicles. So my question is, am I crazy to think about buying and quote unquote importing uh, the Ionic? Ionic into this area, uh, Ryan. Um, what 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 do we think here? Is this? I mean, is he really going to even need that much service to begin with? I mean, it's an EV, right? Yeah. Um, as far as the car goes, um, our reliability data suggests it's going to be fairly reliable. So I think it's above average. You know, we haven't tested an Ionic EV. We tested the uh, the hybrid version, but we have tested the um, Hyundai Kona and the Kia Niro, which would be all the same parts basically. Uh, maybe just a little uh, less range, you know, if that's really what you're um, into or that's the car you want, you know, irregardless if it's they're selling them in that area or not, um, you know, those technicians can move from dealer to dealer. So these guys do know, um, you know, how to work on all these cars. So I wouldn't be too worried about that. And the brakes, the suspension, those things are going to be common uh, across, you know, or common enough. It's it's interesting. The reason why it's not why it's not sold there, uh, you know, there, there there are some issues, you know, getting getting batteries and getting the parts and and selling these vehicles. So car manufacturers are prioritizing the areas where they're being sold. So if there's a lot of demand somewhere, they'll 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 send the vehicles there. The last thing they want is to have an EV sitting in uh, in Iowa or in you know in a state where there aren't necessarily incentives to buy it when they could be selling it in California or even Norway. Way, uh, where there is a big demand for it, but Gabe, doesn't that that kind of leads to some other questions? If you're going to be the only one with the car and it's an EV, what you know, what else should he be looking out for uh, if he buys this? If, if you're willing to go through the hoops of uh, buying it somewhere else in one of the PZEV states, uh, partial zero emission vehicle states, uh, mostly the Northeast and uh, California and Oregon, um, then. Uh, Sure. I mean, as long as you know that you're not taking long trips uh, to Denver and to Kansas City with uh, uh, the Ionic EV, 
then uh, it might be the car for you. And uh, if you're willing to go through the hoops, and, and we've done it, uh, when the Nissan Leaf uh, was sold only in California, I arranged uh, a, a, a truck to haul it to us in Connecticut. I mean, it cost us uh, about $3,000, but... Uh, you know, if you're uh, if you know what you're in for, that's, that's yeah. The way it we've is. got hydrogen cars delivered out to Connecticut, so that's uh yeah. yeah. And and it might be a little less expensive. You could you could arrange to have it trailered uh, trailered to you, and it might be a little less expensive than that since it's only going 600 miles. But but good luck. And if there is an EV out there that floats your boat, whether it's an Ionic or a Mini Cooper, and it makes you happy, well. Th- more power to you, no pun intended. Um, our last question also has to do with EVs, uh, but a little more than that. Uh, it's from Ashford, and he says, I was watching your episode of the Model Y, and I was wondering if Teslas as a whole get decent tire life given their extraordinary performance. Most cars that can achieve that level of performance require pricey tires that wear out quickly. Ryan, this sounds like a question for you. Yeah, um, so... Tesla aside, uh, any EV in general, um, these cars are they're heavier than traditional combustion engine cars, right? Batteries are heavy. They're uh, just the way they're built. They're heavier. More weight, more tire wear. Um, you know, it's like having a, a loaded pickup truck, driving around a loaded pickup truck all the time. There's more weight. Um, the tires are going to wear out faster. There's more, you know, more heat, more energy being used um, to roll these tires down the road, which tr- uh, translates to, tr- you know, tire wear. The other thing is electric cars have um, <laughs> that lovely feeling you feel when you step on the gas pedal in an electric car and you sink into the seat immediately, it almost takes your breath away. Torque, tons of torque. You know, that's another enemy of a, t- a tire. Um, you know, you're, th- as you're taking off and that, when you're feeling that feeling, the tires are struggling to hold onto the road. They're actually, you're actually scrubbing some rubber off every time you do that, believe it or not. You know, the two, you add those two things together, weight and that torque. And you're going to, you're going to wear out tires. Now he's referring to, you know, the performance of Tesla's. <laughs> that's another thing and so you can make a regular ev that just cruises along and doesn't do anything you know crazy and it's going to wear out tires faster now you take one and you put a ton of power a performance tire on it it's going to those are going to wear even quicker also just because um you know naturally the uh, performance tire is a little bit softer compound it's going to wear faster just the nature of it we've talked to some tire manufacturers about this um, and this is a concern and uh, something that they have to work with in the futures as more evs hit the road these tires um <laughs> they need to last longer um you know because that's going to going to become a, a an issue it already is a little bit i think um you know some there are some tesla owners that are surprised um by the amount of tire wear that they're um getting it's uh it's unfortunately it's like <laughs> the, the worst case scenario for the tires, uh, you know, to be on a high performance electric vehicle, um, it's just it's a real challenge for the tire manufacturers to keep the treadwear rates at, at a reasonable amount. So the more fun you're having, the less fun your tires are having <laughs> exactly. is, is essentially exactly. is essentially how it goes. Yeah. yeah. So. That's great answers and great questions this week, too. So uh, if you have a question, we're, we're getting through our, 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 our list of questions. But if you have a question, send it to TalkingCars at iCloud.com. If you want to learn more about the cars that we talked about, more about tires, more about EVs, more about reliability, batteries, all that fun stuff, uh, head over to CR.org or check out the show notes. And uh, thanks for talking cars with us. We'll talk again soon. 